everyone, Alexa Dunn here, and today I am going to be talking about dead genres, tropes. What do you do if your book is DOA? Eternal reminder that I am viewing this through the lens of traditional publishing, which is my background and area of expertise. Because essentially we are talking about the market, and the market definitely depends on your publishing avenue. The market and kind of what thrives versus what doesn't differs depending on trad pub versus self pub. And in fact, some of these dead genres slash tropes we're going to talk about perform well in self publishing, but not in traditional publishing. Also, as usual, I'm primarily focusing on the young adult market, which again is the area I know the most about. This topic came up in my recent Why Publishing Rejects You video, which I will link to down below, and I had an overwhelming number of requests for digging deeper into this particular topic, which I totally get. It's a nightmare for us as writers thinking that we'd spend years of our lives working on something only to find out that it is completely DOA and we have zero shot with it. Y'all want to know more about what is dead versus what's not dead and how to avoid it? and what you should do if you have written a technically dead book. I'm going to cover it all to the best of my ability with the note that a lot of this is speculation. This is very subjective and that's actually the thing. What becomes fascinating and frustrating about publishing, specifically traditional publishing, is that all it takes is a one or two, a few people to go, oh, I really don't think that's working anymore. And then it snowballs into everyone regurgitating the same thing. Oh, well, that can't sell. It's there are issues and pros and cons and all sorts of things within within this. And we're going to talk more about it. So what does dead mean? Dead in publishing essentially means that something isn't sellable. There isn't a market for something. There's not a consumer readership who wants to buy something. And publishers are in the business to sell things. When they put a book out on the shelf, they need to move copies because they've spent all this money up front to pay the author, edit a book, cover, page setting, physically printing books, which is actually quite expensive, and shipping them to bookstores. So if the titles don't move, it can represent a huge loss for the company. So publishers are always in this constant battle of trying to figure out, well, what will sell? <laughs> That's the mystery, that's the question, and honestly, sometimes they're right and sometimes they're wrong, and it's like throwing spaghetti against the wall. But some universal truths can be acknowledged. There are definitely periods where it's really obvious that something is super, super dead, whether it's a genre or a trope. You've probably noticed some of these. We're gonna talk about the big ones like paranormal urban fantasy and dystopia in YA. Those are the big three that have been pretty damn dead for a very long time, and we're going to talk about why. And I just want to say before I jump in that your knee-jerk response to this might be, well, that's stupid. Publishing is stupid. Like, you should just write what you love. You shouldn't think about the market and whether or not something is dead. And I say, yeah, you can write anything you want. Write what you love. I am actually going to go into detail about what to do when you just really want to write the book of your heart, even though you know it's a long shot. But I will also say you can write whatever you want, but you can also not get published with it. So there are trade-offs here. If what you want is to be traditionally published, you actually do have to care what is live and kicking in the market versus what's firmly dead. So I want to talk about dead genres versus dead tropes, though very often they are interconnected. So a dead genre, it's really a dead sub-genre. I already mentioned the big three for YA, paranormal, urban fantasy, and dystopia. These three sub-genres have been real dead for a very long time. Dead in the sense that agents aren't signing them and picking them up because they just cannot sell them to, tradi to traditional publishers, to the major traditional publishers. Essentially, the pipeline has been shut down and agents can only sign things that they can sell. Dystopia, interestingly, is itself a subgenre of sci-fi. I mean, not everyone sees it that way, but most dystopias had more in common with science fiction than they did with fantasy or anything else, like near future contemporaries or even like the Hunger Games. It's not really fantasy. It has sci-fi elements to it, speculative elements to it. Post-apocalyptic is another 
subgenre of sci-fi that, that got tied to dystopian and died alongside it. Honestly, the death of dystopia, well, dystopia in general, dystopia did more for science fiction and YA than anything ever had before, and then it firmly murdered most YA sci-fi because of those subgenres that were so intricately connected to sci-fi concepts. As a sci-fi author, I'm, I'm so sad about it. Paranormal and urban fantasy, of course, are also subgenres that are tied to each other. Many urban fantasy books have paranormal elements. And then there are tropes that can die. So these are uh, tropes or thematic elements or archetypes or just like things that you can put in a book that can die. They have cycles. So good examples of this are zombies, the chosen one in fantasy, elemental magic is a trope, a specific way of approaching fantasy that has had cyclical deaths and rises. Magic, witches, I know that falls under paranormal, but indeed we're going to talk about the return of paranormal YA, which I'm excited to talk about, but it's not the entire subgenre. It's only little pockets of it. The thing is that very often tropes are so firmly tied to genres and subgenres that when the subgenre dies, the trope will die as well. S zombies usually is tied to sci-fi and when sci-fi dis and post-apoc and when sci-fi dystopia post-apocalyptic died, zombies died as well. There was also a saturation issue and this really all comes down to saturation issues. Elemental magic too. You can tie most things dying to oversaturation. So how does this happen? Well, there's one book that does something really, really well and it captures the zeitgeist and readers get excited and, and a book has a big mainstream moment and every single publisher wants to replicate that success. So they buy a ton of books that are just like that. And what happens when you buy a ton of books that are very similar to other books is there ends up being market fatigue, reader fatigue. Like at first, people read and love Twilight and they want to read a million books just like Twilight and they buy them and there's excitement. And then after a while, usually a year or two, the readership goes, oh, I'm tired of reading the same book over and over again. There's nothing fresh or exciting or new from these. They're all knockoffs of this other thing I loved. I'm just, ugh. And then maybe they spark on something new and the readership moves on to something new. In YA, incidentally, that was basically, it moved from like paranormal or urban fantasy because we can't forget like Cassie Clear and Holly Black and the heyday they had in the early to mid 2000s, which fed in to the paranormal boom as well. And then we moved into a huge dystopian boom. We moved into the Hunger Games era and Divergent and all of those. And that's actually a great example. The Hunger Games came first and then Divergent was a perfect, the audience wants more, here's another more. And then we had 8 million mores and the whole subgenre genre died because agents, editors, and readers got sick of seeing the same books over and over again. The books all felt far too similar because all the tropes were similar. The Chosen One, teen who's, who has a secret ability or power and joins a revolution and saves the day. Repeat ad nauseum. So when a subgenre or trope set saturates, very often, most often, it dies. And those three in particular died horrible, huge, dramatic deaths, meaning it went from we want this, we want this to cold turkey. Everyone said, no, we don't want this anymore. And it was like, the door just slammed shut. And if you were on this side of the door and you hadn't gotten your agent or your deal yet, you were screwed if what you were writing was paranormal urban fantasy or dystopia. Not all trends die like this. And th this is what's so fascinating to talk about with publishing. With most subgenres and tropes and types of stories, it is not an all or nothing. It is not a, you either have a book that can sell or it's dead, dead, dead. Most things have a lot more nuance in the publishing industry. And I'm gonna talk about long shots. These are things that have never really blown up in the market and are harder to sell because there's less of a proven market, but they're not impossible to sell. They're not dead. Though I'm also gonna talk about a few things that are dead without having ever saturated <laughs> the complexity of the market. 
And that's the other thing, the market can shift at any time. Things can change at any time. Something that was dead as a doornail one day, someone comes up with the right fresh concept and the right people are pitching the right people and all of a sudden we have a renaissance. That said, usually the thing that comes back, it never comes back the way that it was before. So we're gonna talk about witches and vampires, the slow return of paranormal, kind of. So for a really long time, witch books, magic books, honestly, which really didn't die because of paranormal, it died because of Harry Potter. For a while there, all books that had magic felt too derivative of Harry Potter, even if they were nothing like Harry Potter. And magic never completely went away, but as the selling point hook of a story, it went away for a really long time. But suddenly, Nothing's ever sudden in publishing. That's the other thing. It's so slow. And you do have to be pretty hooked in to the industry to see the shifts, which gets to, well, how do I know what's dead? You don't unless you really pay attention or ask me, but you can't ask me all the time because I don't have the time to tell you all the time, but I have developed a talent for keeping track of the market and figuring out like what's alive and what's dead and watching trends. I do have a video on that, writing to the market. I will link to it down below. It's, it's an art, not a science. But I started seeing this trickle of witch books specifically. The witch books came first, but what's interesting is they weren't witch books the way that they were witch books a decade ago, which had a very heavy paranormal urban fantasy bent. The witch books that started to sell and come out are more, well, we call it contemporary fantasy, don't we now? There's a lot more fantasy elements. They're much darker in the way that YA is darker now. And that's the thing. We've had a huge shift in what YA even is over the past decade. So you could, you can't take a 2007 YA witch concept and sell it in 2019. You have to bring something fresh and new to the table. It's about reinventing these old subgenres and tropes that have died. Vampires is another great example. Dead as a doornail until about a year ago. And all it took was one editor being like, you know, I think I'm ready for vampires again. And then a few agents were like, I, I think I am too. And it kind of snowballs. Now, the only vampire books that we know are coming out so far are by best-selling established authors, but they may be opening the door. So the first one is The Beautiful by Renee Adier. I also happen to have a secret. I know of a best-selling author who is working on a vampire book, and I can tell you absolutely nothing about it, except that I'm so excited because it's subverting tropes. It's potentially reinventing genre. And that's the thing. Vampires coming back, it has to be fresh. It has to subvert what it was before. They're not going to be Twilight knockoffs. They have to be something new and different. And really that's what's happened with urban fantasy. Now we call it contemporary fantasy. And it's not 2003 urban fantasy, it's 2018, 2019 urban fantasy, or even like a bit later, because the Raven Boys came out a many years ago at this point. That's really the first one that I think was like the new urban fantasy under a new title with a slightly new style suiting the new darker directions of YA. But it's an exact, it's not a science as I mentioned. So to that end, I do personally feel dystopia will come back, but it won't be anything like how it was before. And in fact, there are secret dystopias that do slip through. I mean, technically, Brightly Burning's a dystopia. I just, it's post-apocalyptic. I just called it sci-fi. I used space to get it through because I had to hide the dystopian elements. It is possible, depending on how baked into your concept something is, to hide a dead genre or subgenre or trope. Which brings me to, and sorry if this kind of jumps around, I find this topic kind of hard to talk about because it is so complex. So you are getting my brain dump. Yes, it's been outlined, but I'm still jumping a bit and I wanna jump to things that simply never took off because there are certain things specifically, again, in YA, I'm talking about YA, uh, subgenres, tropes that have never been alive in YA. Not really. Always difficult to sell, still difficult to sell. If they do sell, they typically don't 
move off the shelves, which creates this feedback cycle in traditional publishing of, well, we bought that one book and we released it and it didn't do well, so clearly people don't want it. Now, then you have to ask yourself, well, did you market it properly? Did it have the right cover? Sometimes the answer is no. Or sometimes the answer is there's probably really not a robust real market for that in YA. And thus, if you want to be published in YA, you got to avoid these things. And I will die on this hell for some of these because people love to argue with me about these here on YouTube and on Reddit. I said what I said, which is steampunk will never be a thing in YA or has never been a thing in YA. There have been a few steampunkish books that have slipped through, but they've relied heavily on the other aspects of their genre for pitching. So for example, Susan Dennard's first series is steampunk, but it relied more heavily on the historical zombie quasi dystopian ed like edge of it. Like it was sold as a dystopia, even though it's not a dystopia, but that's how it pushed through. But it was technically st a steampunk novel. And it didn't take off. I mean, I really liked it. I have a friend who has a steampunky book coming out. It is Tarnished on the Stars by Rosie Thor, and I think what she did was brilliant. It has steampunky elements, but it's really a space fantasy. It's a space book. But it has clockwork hearts and whatnot, so you can have like little bits of steampunk, but like a, a full-on steampunk YA has never happened and publishing doesn't really want them. Could it change? Sure, but it probably won't. I think the only real exception, I haven't read it, but I'm pretty sure Leviathan by Scott Westerfield is a steampunk, but when you're super famous and best-selling, you are the exception, which is going to be a theme we're going to come to here. The next one, this is the one people try to fight me on constantly, is superheroes. Superheroes and superpowers in YA. I'm sorry, I do not care how popular Marvel is or DC or whatnot. It has never been a thing in YA. It has never taken off. I wrote one. I know. I also thought I was subverting the things. It's like, ooh, but I'm taking the sci-fi angle. It's more X-Men than Marvel. I can totally break the chain. No, no, I didn't. Um, I definitely, definitely didn't. But because I wrote one, I became intimately familiar with the history of superhero YA. And the thing is, there have been a few that have been picked up. YA Publishing did try on a few from non-famous people, and they all face-planted in the market. I have theories about why, but that doesn't change the fact that they did incredibly poorly, so publishing doesn't really want them, and the only exceptions in the past three or four years have been books by super famous authors. So Scott Westerfeld got to sell one, though interestingly he co-wrote it with two people I had never heard of, and it's really his name that got that book through to a publisher, but I don't think it sold very well. There's Renegades by Marissa Meyer because she is Marissa Meyer, and it has done pretty well, which is great, but it does not mean you get to write one because she's Marissa Meyer. Then there's one that sold to Tor, but from a very famous, already established, award-winning adult author. So really my thing here is if you are a nobody, if you are a debut, you are not going to be able to sell a Superpower YA. The odds are just stacked against you. You could be a one in a million shot, but 99% of the time you are throwing away your time and your life writing one, she says year and a half of drafting and revising. And I, I also like I went into it and I thought I would be the exception. And I also have no regrets writing the book. It taught me a lot. But I mean, I face planted I fell I fell on my face. It, it didn't it didn't work. Don't care if Marvel's big YA traditional publishing does not want original superhero superpower fiction by nobody's. They just don't. I don't. So agents will usually auto reject you when they see it because they know they know they can't sell it. IP is a whole other story. That's like Marvel and DC books, but you usually have to be famous to get those projects and like so you're not inventing your own. The next one is time travel, she says, having also written one. So I also became intimately f familiar with the history of time travel and YA. Same thing. Publishing has bought them and many of them, almost all of them have spectacularly flopped. Though, all the YA sci-fi time travel ones have flopped. The ones that have done decently have all been fantasy-based time travel. So that's just a note for you, my friends. Though also a note about international markets, because I did all this research. YA time travel, sci-fi-based time travel really doesn't work in the US. We're gonna be really hard to get an agent, really hard to sell. They just don't stand out. They don't work, unless fantasy-based. But in the UK, 
it's a different market. So there's actually some evidence that science-based time travel books can land, like get an agent and sell in the UK in a way that they can't in the US, which is just a fascinating little market difference because all markets are specific to where, where you are. Another thing that just never lived in traditional publishing is new adult. Oh, new adult. This, this, this is, this is a subgenre really. This is category. Um, you can argue with me as much as you want, but it, it never took off in traditional publishing. There's not a space in the bookstore for new adult. You're either going to be YA with some crossover appeal. That's how you can kind of edge it in, but you can't have all that sexy, sexy sex, unless you're Sarah D. Mass, or you're an adult romance. And actually there has been more adult romance that does have younger protagonists. And so I think that's kind of what the, the adult romance market has shifted a little bit to accommodate in traditional publishing. Uh, new adult does fine in self-publishing and thrives in self-publishing, but like that's one that just never really took off in traditional. And lastly, another good example is Westerns. Like it's not that you can't write a Western and you can't sell a Western. It's just your odds are much lower because there's so few of them, but some of them have gotten through. It's not dead. It's just a long shot. All of these are long shots. Like, and I, I won't tell you, no, I will tell you not to write a superhero book, but everything else, like I'm not going to tell you not to put steampunk elements in your book because you could get through if you're clever. I'm not going to tell you not to write a Western because you can get through if you're clever and so on. And that's the thing. There's a difference between dead and a long shot. And the thing is when agents and publishers tell you something is dead, I do think you should believe them and I think you should listen to them. Anyone who wrote like a paranormal or an urban fantasy or dystopia past the time when publishing started being like very explicit, like this is dead, wasted their time on a certain level. Like you're being foolhardy if you purposefully write something that everyone is telling you they won't publish. Like when you do that, you can't get mad at traditional publishing when they reject you out of hand. And actually can I, what I hate about people doing that is that it leads to all of these, all this turmoil and torture because when you get rejected because something is dead in queries, it's not because you're garbage. It's not because you're a bad writer. It could be because you're a bad writer, but you don't know because when you write in a dead genre, you often get auto rejected for writing something super dead that someone can't sell. So like, it's literally not worth their time to even look at your pages. And then you start to lose hope and think that you're terrible, but it's not you, it's what you're writing. And I do want to say that some things never die. Fantasy and contemporary are evergreen everywhere, but especially YA, like there will always be fantasy books and there will always be contemporary books, contemporary realistic fiction, because these are evergreen genres that people will always want to read stories in. Sci-fi is not evergreen, at least not in YA. Sci-fi is more like a perennial. <laughs> <laughs> pops up sometimes and blossoms and then it, it goes away for, for a while, for a couple seasons. But fantasy and contemporary, you can always sell them. What changes with fantasy and contemporary is what sub genres and tropes become saturated within them. So I mentioned elemental magic. That's become kind of saturated in YA fantasy. So you're gonna have a harder time selling them for a time and probably still court-based fantasy, a little bit saturated. Those kind of saturations and deaths, they're not really deaths, they become long shots essentially. They don't stay dead as long. So fantasy and contemporary are always pretty healthy, but what sells within them ebbs and flows. So like in contemporary for a while there, we all noticed that sick lit was where it was at and rom-coms kind of got pushed to the side for a little while. But then when sick lit saturated, we moved more into kind of serious contemporary literature, but not necessarily sick lit. And now rom-coms are having a resurgence. So there's always an ebb and flow to what sells. But during that time, rom-coms never went away. It was just only a small subset of authors who were writing them and they weren't like the buzziest books or, you know, debuts weren't like selling six figure rom-com and now they can because rom-coms are back. So there's an ebb and a flow to things. I actually have so many feelings about sci-fi and experience with sci-fi that I should probably just make an entire video about how depressing <laughs> why sci-fi is. I'll ruin all of your hopes and dreams if you write it. Though, I mean, I do personally try to be really honest with writers because if you don't go out into YA sci-fi, specifically sci-fi generally, with your eyes wide open, you're gonna be really sad. Just sad, it's, it's sad. And as I mentioned, an important thing to bear in mind is who you are matters. Mostly I'm speaking to you here as aspiring writers, people who want to get agents and who want to sell books. So debuts, 
add to that and I touch on it in the long shot slash dead trope section where like superhero way for example that Marissa Meyer or Scott Westerfeld could sell a concept. They did sell concepts to their publishers. That's because they are established best-selling authors. They bring with them a readership who loves their work and will follow them to whatever they write. Because when a, a publisher is considering what to buy they have to think about ROI, return on investment. How much money are they going to make off of publishing something and is is it a worthwhile investment? So when you have someone who already is like famous and is a guaranteed, brings a guaranteed audience, your risk is much lower and it's worth taking a shot that you're just not gonna take on a debut nobody. Another great example is how Holly Black got to write The Coldest Girl in Cold Town, a vampire book, while vampires were dead, 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 dead because she's Holly Black. But that book didn't lead to a resurgence of vampires. So as you're watching trends, like one famous author selling something doesn't always mean that something comes back and resurges or becomes a new trend. So this is why I caution writers when you're considering what you should be working on, you cannot always look to super famous people because the rules are different for best selling famous established authors. So this brings me to how, how the heck do you read the market? How do you even know what's dead? And how do you know what's up or down if you can't pay attention to these big famous books? I know it's hard. As I mentioned, it's an art, not a science. And I've just developed a knack for it over the years and I'm still not perfect. Every, you know, there have been a few sales recently that really surprised me for frankly borderline paranormal books. And I mean, once the sales happen, you, you go, oh, it must be coming back. But before those sold, I wouldn't have expected it. So things can change rapidly overnight. It's like a weird mood shift that happens. It's one editor who decides they're gonna buy a Phantom of the Opera retelling where you couldn't sell one four years ago and now you can and it's like huh I guess it's changing. But someone sold a Phantom of the Opera retelling so that doesn't mean you get to write one because now they have one. <sighs> And that's the thing. You just have to pay attention. You need to be paying attention to book sales because publishing what's on the shelf is always two years behind bookstores. So I've been seeing some deals recently so I can tell you that little bits of paranormal are creeping back in. You might not notice, however, for a couple of years until those books are out on the shelf. Whereas I can tell you now, ah, maybe, maybe something's coming back. But then, <laughs> Here's the thing, it's a long game. You're gonna have to keep track of what's selling, what people are writing. Another good tip from me is pay attention to pitch contests, see what people are pitching. You can usually see trends, you can see saturations, potential saturations, and you can see what the agents actually like. What are the agents actually requesting or editors who participate? And also what's the caliber of those agents? Cause there's, there's usually when things actually start to shift, it's the better agents, the b big agents, they are the ones who are more likely to drive something coming back than someone who might be a schmagent, basically. Just because a, a, a mediocre or a schmagent signs something doesn't mean something's going to sell. But you can also visit your local bookstore because when you look at the current shelf, you can usually get a pretty good idea of dead, dead, dead. Pay attention to newer releases. Just because the Hunger Games and Divergent are still on the shelf, which they are, doesn't mean you can write and sell a dystopian. You need to look at the new release books. You will see patterns of absence. You should also, as I mentioned, listen to what agents tell you. Many agents are super open about what they are just not interested in right now. They have manuscript wish lists, but some of them will also be honest about anti-manuscript wish list, like what it, they're just not looking for. We all knew the dystopian was dying and had died because every agent under the sun said, I don't want dystopian. Same thing with vampires or paranormal. They were pretty clear, I don't want it. And when an agent tells you, I don't want this, when an overwhelming majority of them tell you, it means that when they are having meetings with editors, because that's what good agents do, they meet with editors regularly and they know what they want to buy, want to buy and what they can get through acquisitions. This is the whole point of agents in their job. They're well networked into the industry and it's trickled down. When an agent tells you they don't want something, it usually means they know they can't sell it. And so that means they're being told by editors and publishers, we don't want that, we can't sell it. So an agent knows that it's a waste of their time to represent it. So listen to agents when they tell you that they can't sell something, that they don't want something. Okay, so this brings me to, 
All right, so you know all this, I've given you all the real talk, but what do you do if you either still really, really want to write in a dead genre or a trope, or you already have? Let's start with you really, really want to. So this is the book of your heart problem. This is the what I'm good at problem, because admittedly, there are some writers who are just really, really good at writing a certain type of book. And if the market dies for that book, you're kind of screwed. You can't force yourself to become a different writer or to love different things. So in this situation, you honestly have to do some soul searching with the other situation as well. But we're going to talk about the preemptive. Because as I mentioned, there is a difference between dead, dead, dead and long shots. And sometimes it is worth writing a long shot because you never know what's going to be fresh enough and different enough or capture the moment or when a trend is going to turn around. And if you've poured your heart and soul into a book that, yeah, was a long shot, but is the book you wanted to write, you could get lucky. Those authors who sold their witch books or their magic books or their Western or their steampunk sci-fi or their portal fantasy. There have been some portal fantasies that sold after everyone has said for over 10 years, more than like 15, you can't sell a portal fantasy in YA. And then two came out, The Light of the End of the World and technically The Hazelwood is Portal. There's also one coming out. Glasstown did a big deal for a Portal fantasy by Sarah Holland. These books can exist, but it's got to be fresh. It's got to be new. And of course, there has to be more to it. The hook isn't, oh, it's a Portal fantasy. There's all this other stuff there. And that's the thing, like never say never. So my thing, if you really want to write in a dead genre or a dead trope, you have to do your soul searching, as I said. And the question you have to ask yourself is, if I spend a, uh, six months, a year, a year and a half, two years, three years, or more, X amount of investment of your life in this book, you'll know your, your writing and your revision speeds. How will you feel if it goes nowhere? Of course, you'll always feel devastated if you have to shelve a book and move on from it. But ultimately, will it be worth it to you to have written the book? Very often the answer is yes. I mean, I told you, I wrote two books in two, two dead subgenres slash tropes. And on both, I hoped, of course, that I was an exception to the rule. With the time travel one, I didn't quite realize what a long shot it was. But by the time I wrote a superpower book, I kind of knew. But I wanted to write them anyway. They were the books that I wanted to write. And I hoped I would be an exception. And I wasn't on either of them. But I don't regret either book. They took me to interesting points in my career. The first one got me an agent, even though it didn't sell. Like, I got close. I was a long shot and I tried. And with the superpower book, I learned a lot about structure and my writing process on that book. So it was super, super valuable. And I also came up with some cool stuff I really, really like that I will probably mine and recycle into another project later. And the abject failure of that book also pushed me to write my debut. I don't think I would have ever written Brightly Burning and gotten my new agent and completely changed the trajectory of my entire career and my life if I hadn't written that book. Now it's easy to reflect on this in hindsight with like a rosy disposition. But yeah, I did make a conscious choice to write long shot books and I don't really regret it. I still advise everyone I talk to not to write a superpower book though, because you will experience heartbreak and disappointment. Learn from me. But it is a personal decision. It is also a personal decision because sometimes, now this kind of gets into what do I do if I've already written a DOA book? You have a couple of choices. Same thing if you decide to write one anyway. So I do think that you should query. Even if it's a long shot, I think it's always worth it to query a book if you've written it, revised it, you know, you've workshopped it with CPs, like you've put all this work into it and it's a solid book, make sure it's solid. It's always worth trying to write a really compelling, great query. And my advice here is do whatever you can to hide what it is if it's dead. I had an author once disagree with me on this point. She thought it was dishonest. And I'm like, this is what we do. How do you think Red Queen got published? It got published because Victoria Aveyard was clever and hid the dystopian elements and the superpower elements. And it was pitched as a romantic fantasy, like a high stakes romance magic fantasy. And voila, we get Red Queen. That is one of the cleverest pivots I've ever seen in my life. And I only have respect for it. And with Brightly Burning, I mean, it's a space 
book. It's a retelling of Jane Eyre. It's also post-apocalyptic. I'm just not front-loading that and promoting it as this is a dystopian post-apocalyptic because that would scuttle the book. It is a sci-fi romance. It's also post-apoc and dystopian and I was able to just kind of shove that to the side. It also wasn't baked into the premise. There's certain things you can't get away from, like superpowers. But again, that steampunk example is a great example. The my friend who has one with steampunk elements coming out, it's not a steampunk YA. It's a sci-fi YA with steampunk elements. So there are ways to package these things into your books and you diminish their importance in your query. You want to get the agent excited about the freshest parts of your manuscript and get them to read it because you never know. So I think it's always worth querying these books. But where you have to make a decision is if you experience rejection across the board. As I mentioned in my rejection video, sometimes you'll just be form rejected, auto rejected, because it's dead. So they know they can't sell it, so they're not going to bother. It's not that you're a bad writer or it's a bad book. And if you end up in a situation where all you want in the world is to work on this book, and all you want in the world is to write more books like it, very often the decision you have to make is you either have to wait for the market to change in traditional publishing, and sometimes it never does, but sometimes it does, but sometimes it never does or you have to self-publish. Very often, genres and tropes that are dead in traditional publishing, I'm speaking mostly to YA here, again, my area of expertise, thrive in self-publishing. They thrive because there is a vacuum in traditional publishing. And the reader, the niche readership for certain subgenres and tropes never dies, but it can be too small and concentrated for it to be worth traditional publishing's time. So paranormal romance readers never went away. There was just diminishing returns in YA and a lot of category fatigue, subgenre fatigue, and so it died out in traditional publishing and thrives in self-publishing. Same thing with urban fantasy YA, by the way. So the decision point you're going to have to come to is, do I want to publish this right now, self-publishing and change my publishing path, which does have repercussions, or do I want to wait, or do I want to write something completely different? So this depends on whether you feel you are capable of doing a total pivot. My general advice for anyone who wants to make it in the industry, by the way, while you should be very, very good at writing one thing that you can sell a lot of, you should also have a wider breadth of talents and, and interests, in my opinion, because sometimes the market really does just work against you and you have to pivot and write something else. And if you're incapable of writing in any other subgenre or exploring any other trope, you can just be screwed, because also some of these don't do well in self-publishing either. Some things just don't have an audience or don't have a big audience or are too hard to market. There's so many factors out of your control. So your decision point here, though, is you can self-publish or you can stick to traditional publishing and move on and make new choices and new decisions. I did a hard pivot and wrote a brand new book that was completely different in a subgenre that's dead now, but wasn't dead when I wrote my book. I got in on a window. So many sci-fi feels, but it was the absolute right decision for me at the right point. I'm so glad I did it. I don't regret the books I wrote, but I experienced that heartache and I took that those lessons into all my subsequent books and attitude toward the industry. And I got my foot in the door and I debuted and here we are. And my note here is, you can also self-publish that work. And if you do that, do your research. I will link down below to some channels that I recommend. There are also subreddits you can look at. There are so many good resources for self-publishing. Don't just throw your book up there because then you are flushing it away. Do your due diligence and do the work to publish it right. But also be aware that if that is your debut, your debut is now self-published. You have done your debut thing and you don't get to do it again in traditional publishing unless you wait for a really long time or change your name. So just FYI to be aware, it is definitely an important decision that you have to make if you have a dead genre book. It's about ultimately what you really want. Within this, my huge, huge tip, move on ASAP, move on quickly, because there is nothing worse than the author. And I've seen this happen so many times, so many, it's depressing, who decides, yeah, I am going to stick to traditional publishing. I'm not going to self-publish this, but they won't give up on the book. I have seen people revise and revise and requery and requery the same DOA book for five or six years. 
literally in the time that I have written five books, given up on two, gotten the publishing deal, written those two, completely pivoted genre, there are people I know who are still stuck on the same book from 2013 and it blows my mind. Don't be that person. Please, I know it's hard to let go, but you have to move on. But don't move on to a book that's almost exactly the same as the one that was DOA because you're gonna get the same results. And that's the thing. You either have to accept in traditional publishing that the market is the market and you always wanna balance writing a book that you love and you want to write with, well, can you sell it because it's a business? Or you go into self-publishing and you realign your expectations for publishing in your career and you do everything that you have to do in the self-publishing space to be successful. There are always chances of having hybrid careers in the long term, but when we're talking about dead genres, it's really kind of a huh, in the moment kind of thing because dead genres and tropes are a long game. And it's hard for me to tell you, like, huh, you don't want to hear it. Sometimes the answer to, oh, but I really want to write a dystopian is to wait. Think about the people who really wanted to write a dystopian in 2012. It's 2019. It's still not back, folks you gotta wait. Sometimes you're waiting eight, nine, ten years. If you're lucky, a trend cycle is only like five years of death, but it's usually way more than that. So you just have to kind of be aware and decide what you want. Decide ultimately what is important for you. And I just want to leave you with, well, first of all, thank you for watching this entire incredibly long video. If you're still here, hi, I hope I helped. But ultimately, many of you asked me to tell you, well, what's dead? And I told you some of the things that are dead in this video with some caveats, like the things that are trickling back in and that a fresh approach very often can revive something, but often not from a debut. It's more likely that a famous person's gonna be able to get something through. But ultimately I can't tell you all of the answers at any given time. Like I can tell you right now what I feel is true and what I have observed, but ultimately nothing is ever guaranteed or completely sure. You can just do your due diligence, ask yourself the questions I posed if you're considering writing something dead or have something that's dead. But ultimately I can't give you all the answers. I just hope this has helped to help you know some of the answers, to find the answers in the future. And just I'll just claim that this is always hard. It's never easy. It's not easy in self-publishing either. There's always these question marks in the struggle of, well, <laughs> What do people even want to read? You just have to kind of do your best, write what you want to write, uh, and be as business-minded as you choose to be, and then accept the consequences and deal with heartache. There's no kind of perfect bumpless career, and there's always going to be kind of ups and downs that you have to face. I do have to say, having written two dead books, uh, as I've kind of mentioned, they taught me a lot and I don't regret them. I still don't wish that heartache on people, but I also know that when people go through that experience that they do become better writers. And whenever I see someone that I see stuck in the cycle where they're just not giving up on something that clearly isn't moving, isn't going to happen, it's dead, you've beaten it to death, you've overqueried, you've overworked it, it's just not gonna sit in the market. I do know that they have to just go through. You, they have to go through that experience. They have to go through that process. And the question mark always is, will they learn and move on and move past it and become better? Or will they get stuck? I hope you don't get stuck because it does break my heart when I see that happen. And I see it happen more than I would like. I hope you join me on the other side of, of, of failure. <laughs> is it failure? Ugh. It's all about how you frame failure. A setback. Join me on, on the other side of setback and move forward. I promise it'll always improve you as a human being and as a writer when you just overcome these setbacks of like the market and things being dead. Ugh. So drop questions down below in the comments. I'm sure you're gonna have plenty of them. Think of this as a kickoff to more discussion though. Again, I can't give you all the answers, but I always try. And give this a thumbs up if you liked it. I'll make more long, rambly discussion pieces, vomiting some of the lessons I've learned about publishing and writing at you that hopefully help. If you're not already subscribed to the channel, go ahead and do that. I post new videos two to three times a week. Thank you so much for watching. And as always, guys, happy writing.